Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. I'm Alan McDaniel, that's my lovely wife Alice, and our dear brother and Lord Mark, and we're glad that you can join us for this time in God's Word. We're continuing on in a study that we started, this will be our, our, our six weeks ago now. Wow. In first, I want to say, second Timothy. Timothy, Paul, second letter to Timothy, and we're in the first chapter in the 12th verse, mm -hmm. after six, okay, well. Rip on at two verses. Yes. <laughs> session. You know what? There's so much in the Word. Yeah, There's right. so much. And every time you go uh, back, it, you it's know, like a good meal. You don't you want to just dash through it and slop it around here. We want to get good stuff out of it. You don't want to get indigestion. Yeah, we, we were uh, in the first chapter in verse 12 last week when we ran out of time. And I want to pick up and go back and just go into that a little bit. Because we're going to talk, I just want to say this here. Okay. Um, in, in that first chapter, in verse 12, we were talking about Paul saying, For I know whom I have believed. And I was talking about intimacy with God. Yes. Because it's one thing to know about God, and it's entirely a different thing to know God. Mm -hmm. All right? God wants an intimate relationship with us, and that's expressed so many places in Scripture. Um, he doesn't and, want to be your acquaintance. No, I, I use this example because I talked about this during the week, and I, I just want to share this. Uh, I, I talked about the fact that I had the opportunity, I think all three of us did, but not necessarily together, to meet with Sam, meet Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart Stores, that was Kevin. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, quite a number of years ago, and spoke with him briefly, very briefly. Mm. But I spoke with him, uh, and Sam Walton was somebody. He, he was a, to the best of my knowledge, he's a dear Christian brother, very very involved in the church that he was a part of, uh, an elder of that church, a teacher of Bible studies in that church. And he was a very, at the time, I think he was probably one of the most successful businessmen in the history of the United mm -hmm. States of America. And if I, if I look at success as I talk about it, he was probably likely the most successful businessman in America. Amassed an incredible fortune from a tiny store in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. We used to do, I did uh, seminars on biblical principles in the workplace. And Sam Walton was somebody that I spoke of very, very much in those seminars. I had studied his life. I read about his life. As a matter of fact, Alice and I were driving across the country from Florida to California one time. And as we were going, she read the uh, autobiography to me, Made in America. Because he was an example and very much akin to Joshua. The things, the characteristics that God spoke to Joshua about in the first chapter of Joshua. You know, to have, that, to have a vision given by God, to be strong and courageous, and to be careful to do all the things that God had told him to do. Mm -hmm. So Sam Walton was that kind of man. So I studied his life. I taught about his life. Uh, we endorsed and sold his books at our seminars. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know him. I knew an awful, I probably knew an awful lot more about Sam Walton than the average Joe on the street. Mm -hmm. But with all I knew about Sam Walton, even having met him, I didn't know him. And I think today all too many Christians know about God mm -hmm. without knowing him. Mm -hmm. And his desire is, and it's expressed so many places in the New Testament and the Old Testament, he wants us to know him. Yes. He wants that intimate relationship. And the thing that I didn't get to talk about last week, and I, I just wanted to make a point of this, you will never have an intimate relationship with anybody that you do not spend time alone with. That's right. Okay. You need to spend time alone with God. Yes, we need fellowship. Mm -hmm. And it says, behold, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Fellowship is great, but you need to spend time alone with God. Mm -hmm. So you get to know him <clears throat> intimately. All right. And as so, that him goes, to know, know, know him is to love, love, love him. And, and I, I do. do. <laughs> yes, I do. Okay. All right, so we're going to pick up in that, that part of uh, verse 12, talking about what Paul says, what I had, he knows what I have trusted in him, trusted into him. 
All right. Mm -hmm. Before we do that, Mark's going to ask God's blessing on our time together. Well, Lord, we just thank you for having an opportunity to come together to hear your word. And Lord, just be with us. We know that you are because we are believers and just expand your word and open it up so we can see it and appreciate it and put it in our lives. Amen. Amen. And feast on it. Hallelujah. Um, so it's a strange thing, I thought, when I first read this for Paul, and I'm not talking about just the other day, that Paul talks about what he had entrusted to God. Mm -hmm. All right? Because I promise you that God's entrusted. What do we have to give him? The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. It all belongs to him. Isn't that not true? So what's that? what is ours to give to the Lord? Well, you want to read Romans chapter 12, verse 1 for me. And we're going to, Alice says we'll read from the New American Standard, which has just one little difference from the King James, because they understood it and it was implied. First one? Romans 12, 1. Okay. Nice and loud. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. That's what we have to offer God, is us. Yes. So I thought about this, and I think I, this is what I ended with last, last week as we were going. There, there are only two things that I can think of that I have the right, really, to entrust to God. My life and my wife. Mm. Because my life is a gift from God. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. My, our life is a gift we didn't do anything to earn it. We didn't do anything to deserve it. It's purely and simply a, a gift that he has given us. Mm -hmm. And it says, an excellent wife who can find. That's a gift from the Lord. Yes. yes. Okay. And giving what is most precious to you is indeed worship. You know the account of Abraham when God called Abraham and told him to take his son, his only son, Isaac, up on Mount Moriah, right, and mm -hmm. offer him unto God. He was asking, this was the great promise. This was the promise that Abraham had been waiting for. This was the promise that had thrilled Abraham, that he would have a son, even in his old age, right? So he has the son, has Isaac. Now God says, I want you to take him up the mountain and give him to me, offer him to me. And he was faithful to do that, right? Yes. When God commanded, he heard, he obeyed. But when he got up there, the Lord did not require Isaac. He said, no, I'll supply the sacrifice because that was a foreshadowing of God providing his son as the only acceptable sacrifice. Yes, right. But Abraham had been willing to give that thing that was most precious. And that's the first example in the Bible of where the English word worship is actually used. Mm -hmm. Right. Abraham, he took his servants, his young men, went to the foot of the mountain and then he says to them, you stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. When they were headed up the mountain, Abraham said, we're going up to worship. Right. All right. He offered to the Lord that which was most precious to him. Okay, my life, should I say my life is precious to me? If you say your life is not precious to you, okay, and I, and I understand this is kind of, a, kind of an oxymoron, because it has no, you know, I, I have surrendered my life, but my life is not my own. For I've died and my life is hidden with Christ and God, right? Mm -hmm. But by the same token, what do I have more that I can offer God than my own life? And when I, so I entrust, I trust him with my life because it was a gift from him in the first place. I trust Alice's life with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we've, that's been put to the test. Mm -hmm. But we know that he is faithful and he loves her more than I love her. And I love her a lot. <laughs> so I trust him. Okay. There's a danger today. And that danger is that so often inside the church today, they are trying to get you to trust God with your money. Yes. By giving money to them. And then God's going to give you more. It's like when you give it to him, he owes you now. They got that totally backwards. It's his money, and he's trusting it with you. Absolutely. 
That, that, that's what I'm saying. That's a danger. And yes, it's a heresy. It is a truth that as a man sows, so shall he reap. Mm -hmm. It is a truth that if you give unto God, he's going to bless you. Yes. But if that's your motivation for doing it, you're missing the truth yes. entirely. Mm -hmm. Because that's not worship. If you're, if you're giving money to God in order to get more back, you're not entrusting, you're, you're, you're treating him like a financial counselor. I'm not going to, that's a heresy. Be on your guard. It's a, a dangerous heresy. And I am put in mind of Ezekiel, Ezekiel the prophet, a mighty prophet of God. When God said to him, listen now, son of man, behold, I am about to take from you the desire of your eyes with a blow. But you shall not mourn and you shall not weep and your tears shall not come. Ezekiel 24, 16. He is talking about Ezekiel's wife. And, and it's clear from you go in there and look at this. Ezekiel madly loved his wife. He loved his wife with a godly love. But God said, I'm going to take her and I don't even want you to mourn. That's a foreshadowing. This was God requiring of a prophet that he give that thing most precious to him. Because God was about to take the nation of Israel yes. because of their disobedience, their adultery, and their, okay? Mm -hmm. That's the life of a prophet. It was a living prophecy because the people of God were rebellious, all right? Yes. So I just wanted to talk about that. Get intimate with God. Get alone with God. Get to truly know him, not just know about him. Uh, you, you know, I pray that through this Bible study, you know a little more about the Lord than you did when, when we started. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to go out with a more intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. If, however, at the end of this, you go get alone with God and talk to him about what you've heard. Talk to him about something that may have struck your spirit during this. Mm -hmm. That's where intimacy comes from. Right, right. Okay. All right, let's go on to 13, verse 13. 2 Timothy 1.13, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which were in Christ Jesus. Well, I certainly want to talk about the standard of sound words. But before I do, I just wanted to mention one thing. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting combination of words here that is important. Faith and love. Okay. We're going to talk about how the devil is out to get you. All right. And you have to be on guard. That's part of this study and part of this letter. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Will you put on the whole armor of God? Would you put on the whole armor of God? Would I? Yeah. Of course. Al said, of course. Do I have a course over? Mm -hmm. Okay. I pray that you would. We are to put on the whole armor of God. And in the whole armor of God, there is the breastplate. Because the heart is where it's all at, right? Mm -hmm. There is the breastplate of righteousness that protects the heart. Yes. Yes? Yes. However, if you look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, let me, let me just do this, all right? Because I'm, it's just over here. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, it says, this is Paul writing to the Thessalonians, he says, but since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Well, wait a minute now. Is Paul contradicting himself? Yeah. In one place he said the breastplate is righteousness. And here he's saying the breastplate is faith and love. It's a mathematical equation. Because faith and love are it's righteousness. Right. Faith and love together <clears throat> are righteousness. Faith without love is not righteousness. Love without faith is not righteousness. But faith and love together our righteousness and they are a breastplate that protects our heart okay you with me yes all right all right so we're to hold fast uh, here to the standard of sound words the king james says hold fast the form of sound words it's the form the standard but the standard i think is in in our english is a much better Gives a better picture of what it is, right? Because in the dictionary, it says that a standard is an approved model, mm -hmm. a rule or principle that is used as a basis for judgment, or a level of excellence or quality. Mm -hmm. Okay? There's a standard. 
How could you build anything without a standard? How can you do anything without a standard? Suppose Mark and I were going to go build something. This this would be good. We would film that for sure. And let's say we're going to do some carpentry work. And for some reason, Mark thinks that an inch, a foot, is 13 and a half inches. Now, I happen to know, I have this on good authority, that a foot is 12 inches. If we started building something, what do you think the result would be? Disaster? Chaos at best. That's right. It would be chaos because we wouldn't have a standard. We wouldn't have, you have to have, there are things that are in our lives, we have to have a standard. And here, there is a standard of sound words. It can't change. It is the, the word of God. That's the standard. In Amos chapter 7, in verses 7 and 8, it says, Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord was standing by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. The Lord said to me, What do you see, Amos? And I said, A plumb line. And the Lord said, Behold, I am about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. You know what a plumb line is? It's a measure. Mm-hmm. They, they use these in carpentry and building and construction as far back as any archaeologist can find. And they use the same thing today. And it doesn't matter whether you're in Timbuktu or New York City. Guess what? That plumb line is going to give you exactly the same result. Why? Why is it going to give you the same result? Yes. Because it relies on gravity, which is straight down. No, you're right. It's straight down. Gravity is straight from God to man. It doesn't change. That's right. Isn't that right? Yes. It is based on a godly thing, a godly truth that gravity is gravity. And when you hang that line, it's going to hang straight down. So you can tell if something is straight, but that becomes the standard. Right. Right? And if the world didn't use the standard, there'd be chaos. There would be crooked buildings all over the place. Well, there's crooked lives. Yeah. Well, there are crooked lives because people are not using that standard of God's word. That's a standard. That means it's everything that we do has to be judged by the word. Everything that we do has to be directed by the word. All right? A plumb line has no cultural deviation. It's truth, mm-hmm. regardless of time, regardless of place, regardless of politics or personal or sexual preferences. It's not politically correct. Well, of course not, because it doesn't pay attention to politically correct. It is a standard. It's an objective standard that doesn't change with the whims of culture. All right. It is Jesus who is the word, the same yesterday, today and yes, forever. It does not change. He was true. In the beginning, for in the beginning was the word. It was true when he spoke through the prophets. It was true when he walked on the face of the earth. It is true today, and it will be true for all eternity. And then it says in Isaiah, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah and said, To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. There's no light in them. Isaiah verse eight, chapter 8, verse 20. And since mankind did not, retain the standard there in the Garden of Eden. Isn't that what happened? Mm -hmm. They were swayed away from that standard. Where that word was challenged by the serpent, false words, unsound words, life-taking rather than life-giving words, they filled the world since then. That makes sense when you consider that we know, this is 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That's the world system. Mm -hmm. Lies in the power of the evil one. The liar by nature and the father of lies. And since that's true, it follows that what Paul wrote to Timothy later in this letter also has to prove true. In in the fourth chapter of this letter, 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, sound words, Mm -hmm. but wanting to have their ears tickled, They will accumulate for themselves teachers and according to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. You know, I was talking about this whole thing with uh, planting a seed and getting getting wealthy. Mm -hmm. 
That, you know what that is? That's people, they're hearing what they want to hear. They're having their ears tickled and being deceived. So, the evil one is the father of lies. And the only way to keep, to retain the standard of sound words is, as Jesus said, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue or abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. That's the only way for you to make sure you're walking in truth is to abide in God's word Amen. because that is the sound words. That is the standard of sound words. And if you get swept away by the culture or by false teaching or heresies here and there, you're going to pay a price, a heavy, heavy price. So that's why he goes on in the 14th verse, right? Paul goes on and says, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Guard through the Holy Spirit. You guard what is precious to you. You guard what's important to you. You may entrust uh, what's most precious to you to someone or something even stronger than yourself. A bank, for example, or a security company. Right? If you have something precious, you're, are you not likely to put it in a safe, put it in a safe somewhere? Yeah. But you're, in tr you're putting it someplace where you know that it is, quote unquote, safe. All right? If it's really precious, what you want to do is trust it to the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Don't trust in yourself. Listen to what I'm saying. But trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Right? That's what you're supposed to trust in. Trust in the Lord. <clears throat> And then God spoke to the prophet Zechariah, and he said, not, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 4, 6. If you want something to be safe, you get to the place where you can surely trust and trust these things to the Holy Spirit. God is able, and he has promised to take care of you. He's, what has he entrusted to you? His word. Well, it says the treasure entrusted to you. It's a treasure. The love that he's poured into our hearts. The word that he's poured into our hearts. What, what does the word treasure mean to you? Something that's precious. Something of oh. value. I mean, I hear people go crazy, you know, over the lottery. Somebody won the lottery, this is much money in the lottery. Is that a treasure? No, it's. The rust is, the rust is going to get to it. The moths are going to get to it. It's a worldly it's, treasure. It, well, and it'll pass mm -hmm. because the world's going to pass, right? God has entrusted us with a treasure. The great and most precious treasure lies in and on your heart. Mm -hmm. Remember I said it's all on the heart. That's why mm -hmm. the breastplate has to be there, That's right? where the guard, guard you. What is, so what? Right? His love. What the treasure of God? Mm -hmm. His love. The love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to you, to us. Mm -hmm. right? Romans 5, 5. Guard the love. You, ha you have to guard it. That's, mm -hmm. Okay? You, you think, well, I love somebody, and you better be on Attacked. guard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Satan will attack the love within you. Yes. Yes. Okay? Because he will encourage you to hate he will encourage you to seek revenge. Mm -hmm. He will encourage you to become bitter. And most of all, he will encourage you to have pride. He's trying to replace it all the time with those things. Because pride is love of self. Mm -hmm. And love of self, which is the dominant thing in the last days, the perilous last days, according to this letter later mm -hmm. on, right? Will find no room or reason to love others. Love of self will push out all the love of others. There's no room for anything else. No, because you fill up. Pride mm -hmm. fills you up with love mm -hmm. of self. So if you want to guard the love that's in you, be on guard against pride. Yes. And I'm telling you that pride is insidious. It's always pushing, always knocking, always there. Okay? Constant. The other thing that he has given us in this treasure, he's given us two things that are really the treasure of God. His love and his word. That's right. He has entrusted us with his word. He's inscribed it on our hearts. Inscribed it on the tablets of our heart, right? Mm -hmm. And then it says in Jeremiah 31, 33, 
just to be in line with that. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Jeremiah 31, 33. You have to guard the word. The word within you is always under attack by that father of lies. This is how the whole mess started out. When Satan came, that serpent of old came to Eve, the woman, and said to her, as God really said, calling it into question. Yes. You have to, the, the, this word, you have to nourish it. You have to cultivate it. You have to feed on it and feast on it. You have to abide in it. God has given us, he's entrusted us with his treasure, his love and his word for a purpose. To receive it back with interest when he comes. You ever think about that? Because if you go to Matthew 25 and read the parable that he told about a rich man who went and left his servants in charge of things, right? Mm -hmm. We are responsible and accountable for what has been entrusted to us by the Lord. We're accountable. Yes. Right? Yes. When it says, listen to this now, this is from Matthew 25, 14. And you can go read this in Matthew 25. Mm -hmm. it, it, would, it would serve you well. Just, it's just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves, servants, and entrusted his possessions to them. Right? That's, okay, that's the, and he goes on. So then when it said, he, the master came back and settled accounts. Mm -hmm. To the one who was faithful in using what he was given, it's written, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. That's the measure of success. This That's is what, what I used to, want to hear. This is the, what I used to tell people in the seminar. This was mm -hmm. the thing I preached all over. I mean, the fact is, um, the, you can define success any way you want, but I'll tell you how I define success. Yes. That on the day that you come face to face with him, those are the words you hear. Mm -hmm. Well done, my faithful servant. Because if you don't hear those words, you know what? You didn't bring any money with you. Your bank account is back. Right? That's what he's going to be looking for. That's the only back. measure of success is, did you please the Lord or did you not please the Lord? Because to the person who was not faithful, who did not do the things he was supposed to do. It says in Matthew 25, 30, throw out the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Is that harsh? If you think it's harsh, if you don't like it, write this down. Write to Jesus Christ at heavenlythrone.org.com, whatever. Don't come to me because I'm not the one that thought this up, all right? That's the Word of God. We are accountable for the Word of God. Well, we're not going to have time to get into the 15th verse, speeding along as we usually do. But do be back next week, all right? But like I said, the goal here is, yes, to know more about the Lord. But the true goal, goal is to stimulate us to seek intimacy with God to get to that place where we are have that that personal relationship with him that is the treasure of our life so father we thank you Lord God that you have chosen to love us Lord God that we didn't deserve that love we didn't do anything to earn that love but you chose to pour it out into our lives and make it available to all for you love the world so much that you gave your only begotten son I pray, Lord God, that we would seek you, that we would go and spend time with you, that we get to know you better. And in the meantime, that we would get to know the word better. We just praise you. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Till next week, God bless you and goodbye. Thank you. Mighty love